Um, so, hello everyone. Well, welcome to our second book author interview of the Max Weber Program Multidisciplinary Research Workshop entitled uh, Envisioning the Global South. So my name is Wan Shu Kong. I'm a fellow at the Max Weber Program. I'm very, very delighted to introduce our author today, Dr. Luis uh, Eslava, to our audience. So Luis is a reader in international law at the University of Kent, a senior fellow at Melbourne Law School, an international professor at Universidad Externa uh, de Colombia, and a member of the teaching faculty of um, Institute for Global Law and Policy at Harvard Law School. Uh, so for many people like me, uh, who say, who are working in the area of international law hum or human rights, or who are interested in, uh, for example, third world approaches to international law or post-colonial studies or cr uh, critical race theories, uh, Louis has always been a very inspiring uh, scholar for us, since Louis has really transformed uh, the way we do uh, legal scholarship and the way we relate to our field by bringing uh, methodologies and insights from uh, sociology, anthropology, geography, history, uh, and so on to the study and research of international law. So, and actually one of my, say, repetitive rea uh, reaction after reading Lewis work is uh, the feeling of, liberation in the sense of, wow, like a poster or hip hop lyrics can be say a, a kind of material for doing uh, research or study international law. So I'm really excited that Luis can join us and share with us his current book project entitled um, Broken Worlds, New Poverty, Law and Youth Violence. So Louise, I'll give you the floor and could you just uh, tell us in a couple of minutes what story you want to tell with this book and what you want to achieve uh, in the project? Um, when you let me start first, uh, thanking you for inviting me and for the program to host uh, this series of uh, conversations. Um, and thanks so much for the uh, super generous uh, in, uh, introduction. That's very, uh, that was very moving. Um, so with Broken Worlds, I want to um, continue what I've been, um, the line of work that I've been developing over the recent years, uh, which in which I've been trying to figure out um, methodological avenues, as well as uh, tracing the contours of the operation of international forces on the ground. And let me say a couple of things about um, these two ideas. So the methodological point and the substantive point. So the methodological point is that in my work, like the work of many of um, colleagues associated to critical approaches to international law, um, theoretical approaches to international law, law and post-colonial theory, <clears throat> critical race theory and law, and most recently law and political economy, there has been an ambition to develop new tools to, uh, to capture how law has become part of the fabric of the planet. And, um, and so what I've tried to do in my work, what I've been trying to do is to, is to engage with that through a combination of a historical approach to global processes, as well as an ethnographic approach. And the idea there is that uh, in bringing history, history ethnography in conversation with many other fields uh, and, and, and insight from political theory to legal theory uh, to the humanities, uh, you slowly develop a sensibility, a capacity to capture how current events uh, as they happen on the ground uh, embody global processes that, have, that are not only taking place in the present moment, but that have been um, uh, in construction undergo for uh, many, many uh, years, if not centuries. Uh, so Broken Worlds tries to do that, uh, paying attention to the transformations of 
uh, poverty in the 21st century. And that's the, the substantive uh, intervention that I'm trying to do here. And it is um, how we can describe uh, global life uh, through the lenses of the experience of these new types of poverty that, um, that are similar to all the forms of poverty, but that uh, because of global transformations is acquiring a new character. And perhaps we can explore that point about uh, what are those forces and what is um, why I'm talking here about new poverty and not simply just uh, poverty in a second, but I will leave it like that. So uh, Broken Worlds is, is an attempt to continue uh, uh, my line of work on, on ways of trying to understand methodologically the international legal order, great large, and secondly, on a substantive level, how we can understand the uh, global life and the contours of global life by paying attention to the experience of poverty uh, by people, especially uh, in all my uh, in my other work in uh, primarily in the global south, but not necessarily uh, in the global south, uh, geographically speaking. Sure. Uh, so uh, when we were preparing uh, this interview, we also talked about uh, the current condition of doing research and writing a book about new poverty and uh, global south. So maybe could you uh, could you tell us, well, since the COVID, how is this book evolving and uh, uh, any changes to your uh, take on how to write a book, uh, or how to write a story about new poverty or uh, your position as a scholar uh, in the context of a global pandemic. Thank you. Yeah, so the pandemic has been has been uh, has been an event in itself for the project. Um, my um, broken worlds, um, like my other work, relies heavily on field work, uh, the possibility of going and and spending as much time as possible with uh, with communities, with individuals, uh, in the places uh, that um, you know, kind of give me uh, ideas and insights of what's going on in the world, especially again in the global south. Um, Broken Worlds um, uses 10 years of radio field work in Colombia. Um, but uh, my aspiration was an, in the previous year, 2020 and uh, 2021, to um, go and engage with the final parts of the book, uh, which um, which I'm still struggling with, which is uh, what is the what is the what is the broader point that I want to make about uh, law, actually, and uh, and that has been hasn't been possible uh, for obvious reasons. Um, so the writing is not going very well <laughs> because of uh, because of the impossibility of traveling. Uh, however, the pandemic has been uh, really important. Uh, for, for many reasons, a couple uh, worth mentioning here. One is that many of the, the suspicions that I had about the transformation of poverty in the 21st century have been confirmed. Uh, it is no, it is no, um, uh, nothing new, I'm sure for many of you in the audience, that uh, the pandemic has basically been a disaster in terms of uh, the gains that we have obtained globally to eliminate extreme poverty and to reduce the number of people living just above the poverty line. Um, statistics are, are really uh, uh, incredible and sad, um, or incredibly sad. Uh, the, you know, the World Bank recently in January 2021 uh, confirmed, for example, that around 150 million people have been pushed into extreme poverty in addition to uh, the um, um, 800,000 that uh, million that um, 800 million that that more or less uh, well, we're already living there. So we have around 150 uh, new what they call the World Bank called new poor new poor as a result of the pandemic. Uh, but it, the pandemic has also pushed around 200 million into poverty. So that poverty then exists just above the poverty line. So yeah, the pandemic has as um, uh, in that sense, um, highlighted the nature of poverty today, which is that uh, you know we have uh, uh, we have made enormous gains in terms of shrinking the number of people living in extreme poverty, 
but we are living in a world in which around 65%, 70% of the people live with less than $10 per day. So which means this just above the poverty line. Um, and that has become a kind of the, the resilient condition of the planet. And the pandemic has basically, um, yeah, once again, confirmed uh, that, um, that, that situation. Um, well, that predicament more than a situation. Um, and it's a predicament because part of the, the, the point of this new poverty, which uh, is what I discuss in the book, is that uh, we not only have a planet where 65, 70% of the population uh, uh, live with less than $10 per day, and $10 per day is important because it's the, the uh, benchmark that uh, many international, international organizations, including the World Bank, uses to um, to define whether you have or not the uh, minimum required to live a dignified life in the 20th century, the, the, the 21st century, the World Bank says that it's $10 at least. Uh, so we live in a, in a planet where most of the people are struggling to live a, 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 a dignified life, if you keep that as, as an standard. Um, but it is a predicament because the global legal, political, economic order can no longer use uh, the usual tools to lift people out of poverty uh, because of processes of uh, uh, deindustrialization, financialization, uh, digitalization, uh, uh, financialization of the global economy. And if we revert uh, some of those trends, for example, we commit ourselves once again uh, to becoming industrial or manufacturing powers, uh, basically you will be contributing to uh, climate change. So we'll, we're in a very peculiar moment. Um, and the, and the pandemic has kind of, once again, kind of highlighted that. Now, the pandemic has also been interesting in a, in a perhaps more productive way because it has, because um, I haven't been able to travel. Uh, I, I started, um, I have been able to start a couple of projects um, with the IEL collective. Um, we started an, initi an initiative called the Ruptures 21 towards new, uh, economy, social, societies, and legalities. And, and with that initiative, we are, have been doing a couple of interventions on the effects of the pandemic on, on the informal economy and informal workers and their families. And uh, another um, intervention on uh, life, gender, and race and work in the Pacific coast of uh, Colombia. And uh, so, and through that, those two initiatives have been able to uh, coordinate a project uh, in which there are also anthropologists involved. So I've been doing remote uh, vicarious uh, ethnography and that has been really interesting and has opened um, new avenues to think about doing social legal work in times of you know, uh, health crisis, but more interestingly, be part of uh, multidisciplinary uh, research teams that, um, that are trying to grasp how global phenomena are impacting very localized forms of life and, and, and resistance to, yeah. Oh, that's, that's very interesting. So, uh, well, thank you for linking that question also to um, definition or your understanding uh, about new poverty and also the global forces behind in creating that situation of new poverty. And also, it's also very interesting to hear how you, for example, as scholars, we all are living under, you know, certain conjunctures and how that can be transformed in a more productive way to do um, still legal, social legal work and how um, the, 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 the transformation of that le social legal work it, it itself can probably have a consequence on the scholarship that eventually we produce. So uh, maybe I'll get back to the question in terms of, well, I'll connect that question to uh, methodology at the later point of the interview. So maybe now uh, I'd like just to ask you about, uh, well, starting with the title of the book as we always do with the book. So I'm intrigued by, um, uh, the image of broken words and the sense that you also use plural uh, sense uh, for the uh, for, well, broken words. So I wonder what kind of uh, imagery you had in your mind or what kind of imagery you want to invoke uh, from uh, the reader. Why 
not, uh, for example, use like single singular term, say broken world. So there's a unity of word at the beginning or at some point, but eventually broken into different pieces. Or are we talking about a multitude of different realities at the very beginning, but then how do you consider these different uh, realities as broken in a sense? So, so maybe, and, and just also how do you uh, see that image image um, in comparison with some of other very uh, figurative term that you use in your other work, for example, a world uh, in convulsion. Mm -hmm. So maybe just um, talk a little bit about the title. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for, uh, also thanks for um, uh, forcing me to think across different, uh, my different publications and different efforts to theorize what's going on. Um, I, 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 just to start, broken wills and the idea of using a plural is just to make the simple, uh, yeah, it's still important point to make that when we deal with uh, people on the ground, in particular, I feel people in the global south and at the margins of the global south, they individuals and community are not fully subsumed within the modern project okay so the the modern project as a as a as a as a, as a modality of um, living together that is part of the european civilizatory project uh, it, it has become a, a planetary experience but it is no it's still a full encompassing experience um, in many parts of the world, again, on the peripheries of the world system, but even, even at the heart of Europe, you know, there's still pockets that resist to being absolutely subsumed. Uh, and, and that resistance is not necessarily a, a kind of a coordinated uh, resistance, it's just uh, people, people are pretty tough and people you know, find ways to um, fight back or don't pay attention or basically, you know, um, walk away when things they don't like. Uh, and so now the, the situation is, however, that we are part of a world that has become, and this is a point that many people have made, of course, are extremely interconnected. Uh, increasingly surveilled, um, increasingly draconian in the sense of if you don't follow a particular for, uh, uh, conceptualizations about what should be your future or how you should manage your finances or how you behave, well, you can be penalized. Um, uh, from, for example, increasingly, uh, if you don't have a, it's got to put it in a simple terms, you don't have a, an, um, a credit card or a uh, debit card, you basically are stuffed. And then if you, um, uh, someone then want to run away from your country because it's no offers you a job, you can't do it because um, now even to leave your city and take a plane uh, in a domestic flight, you will need your IDs and you know, and the list continues. So even when you want to exercise resistance to that civilizatory modality called the modern world, modernity, it is it is pretty hard. So now, kind of attending to that, so that the 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 the, the multiple worlds that continue to exist subsume within that world, uh, is the image that I have in in, in my mind. Uh, when you look, when you bring poverty into the picture, okay, when you bring poverty into the picture, it, the, the thing becomes more uh, volatile because the, as we know, in many occasions, the ability for you to live an independent life or for the ability for you to foster alternative forms of life rely heavily on whether or not you have the capacity to cover your basics, okay? And, and, and cover more than your basics. And my, for my previous um, field work in, uh, in, 
when I've been studying, for example, uh, informal neighborhoods or when I have been studying uh, small criminality in, in the global south, that the, the ability to secure a minimum to, to survive it defines whether you are able to basically, uh, well, obviously, subsist, but also uh, have a mental space to organize yourself socially and uh, invest time in your uh, community work and so on and so forth. So, so on and so forth. And so the idea of broken worlds and uh, no, the idea of a world in which there are plurality of worlds, but there is an ongoing maldistribution of resources and that are producing is that many of those worlds, especially the weak the weak ones, the ones that don't have, that are not very strong, uh, and the constant threat. Um, so here, this is, other people talk about this in terms of, of uh, universality versus pluriversality. And, and I think here, that's the way I'm, that I'm, I'm moving. Uh, I just want to make the point that that pluriversality is and the threat and, and some of those pluriverses or those, some of those universes within the big uh, yeah, uh, lay modern universe um, are canceled and constant constantly. Um, this connects to the subtitle of the, of the book in which I make reference to that, that, that the people, the specific people that I have in mind is uh, uh, young people. Uh, and it, I just want to honor the fact that young people are extremely important when you think in, in sociological, anthropological, uh, um, social transformational terms, because it is in, in, a, in a way, it is on their shoulders to, to carry over the that task of creating new worlds or maintaining, uh, preserving uh, all the previous worlds into the mm. future. Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a point that uh, often it is forgotten when, uh, when we think about uh, social transformation, um, the, the, the role that um, young people uh, plays in this context. Well, yeah. thank, you. thank you very much for uh, ra raising this issue of young people because say, from uh, from the field where I come from, for example, human rights, even for human rights law, it's not a particular category of population that's really singled out in, for example, human rights treaties. Uh, there are treaties based on, for example, um, uh, gender or uh, ethnicity and so on, but not really in terms of age. And it seems to, it just seems like human rights or international law seem to be, uh, well, quite, let's say indifferent to people's age, even though the fact that intergenerational uh, relationship is really how uh, inequality gets perpetuated throughout time. Uh, so uh, this relates to actually two questions. So one would be, uh, of course, you identify a group as uh, say the object of inquiry. And then so within that pro uh, this group of people, and especially in the Colombian context, um, where people have, say, for, for example, multiple skin colors. So that means within that group, there is a definitely an element of intersectionality. And then how do you address this issue? How do you present, well, say, represent this group of people? And I have the second question is related to actually resistance that you also mentioned in, uh, earlier, but maybe, maybe I'll. I'll uh, I'll, I'll let you answer the, the, the first question and then we, we go to resistance. Perfect, the question of intersectionality and how that has to do with the, 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 my population group, my uh, young people as my, my target here. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, it, I, I mean, you know, I, 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 I need to start by saying that you know, definitely, I mean, the, the, I think one of the, the lessons given by the social sciences and humanities over recent years is that we can't not, not think in terms of inter, in, in, in terms of intersectionality or the importance of uh, cross and forces regimes of differentiation and exclusion and how people come to experience them. Uh, th that definitely uh, more in everything that uh, I try I try to do. Um, now 
what is interesting about the the work that uh, I'm trying to make sense of in um, Broken Worlds is that um, and to explore the other elements of the subtitle and the book. So I'm trying to think about uh, this experience of new poverty as it impacts people and how that it relates to questions of balance. So, and, um, and, and how law maintains or is, is there um, and in the, sustains this arrangement. And, and this has to do with intersectionality because many of the young people that ended up uh, at the heart of that intersection of poverty violence and being young, yeah, are, are male. So it is a very, uh, it's a very, there's a very particular story about maleness here mm -hmm. and masculinity in the 21st century in the global south. Um, and, and it is a story that in the case of Colombia, it relates to race, but it is not necessarily race as often misunderstood within, for example, US, in a US context, where there's a very kind of clear lines of racialization in terms of being member of the, and the of in the African-American community or the Latino community or the, or the um, Asian community. Uh, in the Colombian context, because of the long history of of colonialism that dates back five centuries, um, issues of race of that nature appears, but there's a whole kind of trickle of skin uh, tones and colors and textures uh, that maps against violence, maps against poverty, marks against exclusion where you are young people, but are not necessarily uh, uh, perfectly. So, I think uh, what I'm trying to say here is that intersectionality becomes very important in the kind of work and the kind of reading that I'm trying to advance, not because it solves the issue and, and offers you a neat entry point into how to understand process of exclusion and how they overlap uh, or that they operate across, for example, class, gender, race, um, ethnicity, geographical positioning, so on and so forth. It is, it is interesting because it forces you to understand the diversity on the ground and how there's a whole multiplicity of processes of exclusion happening that should always be understood in, in terms of the local history and operation. Um, I'm gonna say that again in a, in a much neater way. Uh, I feel that in order to pay respect for something like intersectionality, it is important to remain open to the reality of life on the ground. Uh, so you encounter intersectionality sometimes quite neatly when uh, a racialized woman um, faces exclusions based on her race, gender, uh, and class. Yeah, and that's an easy kind of exercise of realizing the value of intersectionality, but intersectionality also operates in the case of one of these um, marginalized young male Colombians that perhaps is not black, but perhaps is not white, but perhaps it doesn't come from the poorest part of the city, but this, but that. Um, and then that's when I think intersectionality shows its greatest power. Um, knowing being the formula to speak about diversity and the diversity of exclusion, but more as an invitation to always remain attentive to the complexities of the field. And so that's what I try to do in my work. Um, uh, and the, in, in this project. And the other thing that is obviously interesting here is that obviously that story about masculinity or the unique story about masculinity that one can tell when you look at violence, poverty, and, 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 and young people in a context like Colombia. It is never just about masculinity. It's always, this is a dialectical processes. Yeah. Uh, so 
um, th these young male uh, kids that I have followed um, in the past for, for example, my project on, on petty crime. Um, uh, they, you know, members of the friends are but obviously, of course, uh, also women. Uh, and there's a whole kind of uh, uh, ecology there that operates between these uh, young male guys and, 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 and the female friends. Um, but they themselves, they themselves are quite not, are not necessarily the hyper macho traditional uh, masculine figures. They, um, some of the of the um, young people that we follow for on that project um, are kids that are quite today very versant in you know in gender and sexuality uh, concepts and even though they are very poor and very marginalized and on the verge sometimes of being themselves criminals they have many of them receive uh, talks and take part of uh, training courses given by NGOs that work on issues of gender and sexuality. So they are very good at talking about, you know, uh, um, you know, uh, being transgenders and are quite attuned to conversations about the fluidity of, of, of the category of male and female uh, in, a, in ways that are actually quite surprising. And they themselves also embody a world in which these categories are changing. So some of these kids, for example, um, one of the fashion a few years ago was to uh, put varnish on the fingernails and um, quite pay a huge amount of attention to the looks, um, uh, bleach the eyelashes uh, in one eye remain dark, the other one uh, uh, bleach white. Um, yeah, so obviously, spending a huge amount of time finding a very big uh, jewelry for themselves. I'm just saying this because I want to uh, kind of put here the value of intersectionality, you know, once again, as a way of kind of capturing the neat intersection between different forms of exclusion, but as an invitation to, to engage in, uh, with the messiness of the world. That's very interesting. Actually, um, connects very nicely with uh, the question about resistance. And I thought, well, you mentioned like fashion and doing nail polish as a way of self-expression and uh, say, I, well, creating a sense of identity. And that's like fluidity of you know masculinity or femininity. I would see that as also a way of uh, of resist mm. re resisting. Um, so uh, the question would be, so how do you, uh, what, what kind of account you give to sort of attempts of resistance or self-liberation of these young people? I find if we zoom in to um, a certain kind of uh, say attempts, for example, through fashion or through dancing or through music, that kind of sort of counterculture, I find them really, really powerful. But if we zoom out, I find them really, really uh, flimsy as well. Mm -hmm. So um, I think you, uh, in a different piece, you mentioned how uh, these young people uh, either, uh, let's say, just say th those people who hang out with the guns, they sort of, um, uh, they really look up to a kind of lifestyle that's like, for example, on Instagram, mm -hmm. and then attach so much significance to, mm. for example, a jumper that with Adidas uh, logo. And with that, it's kind of a resistance and the self-liberation but highly attached to global uh, market economy. Mm. And uh, in the, the, the Chinese documentary that actually, uh, which was uh, sh uh, shown a little bit at the launching event, we find, okay, so those people we call as martyrs, um, if you zoom out from that, that uh, group, you find it's very, very easy for them to get parodied. Mm. So they, they are not really, you know, powerfully subverting the hierarchy mm. of a social norm, but actually, the, mm. it, I, I mean, just their resistance is re very, very fry. Also, I mean, what kind of, uh, you know, how do you address this combination of both, you know, power and mm. the fragility? Well, I guess maybe if you want, you can uh, share the video uh, from Algeria's eyes. 
Uh, yeah, I perfect. It's a good place to, to, to show it. Yeah, great. Uh, so, um, so for the public, so uh, in our preparation to this talk, we ended up uh, talking about documentaries and movies and <laughs> video clips. Uh, so I, after I finish what I'm going to say now, I'm going to show you a, a little clip from Al Jazeera that, that talks about how we have come to understand, one way of an interpretation is how we have come to understand dignity in the 21st century um, uh, on the face of uh, large, big, enormous cultural transformations in terms of the representation of the global South, but also how the global economic order has changed and has kind of uh, narrowed down, transformed, shaped how we uh, have come to talk about dignity today. Um, so, but before uh, I showed you the video, uh, so in terms of resistance, it, 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 this is really interesting question. Um, and it goes at the heart again to the idea of broken worlds. So um, to call, uh, for example, a sub-community of, uh, you know, the, the, the cultural practices of gangs, youth gangs in uh, place in the global south or even groups of friends in the global south or cultural practices that develop in community uh, movements uh, in, in, in global south context and also in the global north context. To call that as a world seems to be very much um, kind of a celebratory uh, move and, and one that even elevates that to a whole kind of unique ontological status. Um, and many, a, 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 a very valid critique will be that that will be due from the global north or a, a global south person now living in the global north and obsessed with how things are, are in the tropics and you celebrate that and then you just kind of give them a whole um, new kind of catch her to life than at the end of the day are precarious. Um, I, 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 I am cognizant of that. And so what I've been trying to do in, in my previous work that is now, I'm trying now to summarize in the Broken Walls project is to rather than adopting um, a, a hard normative assessment on whether that resistance is valid or not, uh, you can you can adopt that, and, and I think there's a value of saying, you know, how far this can take us. Um, instead of just adopting that normative stake on it, I have uh, imposed as my duty understanding in the first place why that happens, and what are the forms that it takes, and what are the why that uh, reaction is there, the instinctual reaction to seek refuge in an obsession to uh, trainers of a particular brand. Um, that's of course, that's a very anthropological of me, but, but I think there's a value in it because it helps you to well, discover the rationalities in place uh, that uh, enable people and to animate, enable animate, animate people's uh, daily existent in, in a place, in a world that is, in a world order that is extremely complex. So just to be a bit more concrete, um, in that work uh, that appears in an article called Security and Development Question uh, Mark, uh, my colleague and good friend Lina Buccelli and I, we followed, um, it came the, as a result of an ethnographic project in which we followed for around three years or so, uh, local officials and, 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 and young people uh, at risk of getting involved or already involved in petty criminality in the city of Cali. And then we follow these two groups and how they engage with each other through a new modality of development programs. Um, and so what we discover is that these kids, uh, young people, uh, uh, they actually want to be integrated. They, they, they know that if they continue to live in the war, as they call it, they will be killed. Pretty much more of, most of them are, are killed or, or severely injured um, before they reach the age of 21, or they ended up in jail. Uh, so they really want to be integrated. Um, they actually are quite keen participants of these programs. Uh, these programs are actually designed by people that are, have a massive heart, that really invest the best of uh, the energy. Uh, the city 
uh, has done in many occasions the best to put resources. Obviously, they always can put more, but you know, the political deal only managed to put certain amount of resources, much more than in previous years. Um, these are at the cutting edge of interventions in uh, 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 in favor of young people. They are the things that you want to see, and the problem is that they don't deliver. They don't deliver mm -hmm. what that transformation that you want. They don't. They don't secure that type of integration that is long term. So they don't, what they ended up doing, however, is to kind of establish these uh, bridges between the official world and these kids. And, and these kids uh, remain there kind of in a, liminal, in a liminal place between exclusion and integration. And, and as a result of that, they become ambivalent to their previous identity, but unable to abandon it. And that privilege identity, especially if you are engaged in, in, in proper gang uh, activities, uh, very much associated as adopting a persona very much furnished by wearing, for example, shaving your head, in your head a Nike logo, uh, walking the streets with a Nike jumper, with a Nike uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Pants and then uh, Nike shoes uh, with very big jewelry and you know the eyelashes uh, uh, tied and so on and so forth. And then they then they get they uh, they start going to these programs. They realize that they need to drop some of these features that have identified them, but they they cannot abandon all of those features and all of these. Um, uh, ways of expressing themselves because the city and the official world is not offer them an alternative. Uh, and, and, and to be honest, <laughs> they actually get more integration and they get more participation and they get a clearer place in the city if they continue to anchor themselves in that type of consumption. Uh, now, the problem of that arrangement is that uh, if you attach your desires to a pair of Nike shoes that you cannot afford and actually no one can afford or they, no, no one, no, the last majority of the population cannot afford because obviously they are producing the global north and the original price is set in dollars and US dollars. So it's always out of reach. And the only way for you to satisfy that those needs is to either, um, you know, you, for some reason you find money on the ground or you slowly, slowly, once again, start taking part of secrets of the illegal economy and the illegal market, and then you get trapped. Um, so, so then, so then in that context, thinking about resistance is pretty tricky because, again, it is no. We would love to have pure forms of resistance, um, and, and and sometimes they are there, and then when people come and organize themselves, they they, they emerged and then we need to be ready to support it and clap and, and, and vote and cast our votes in favor of those forms of resistance. But there's also a plenty of forms of constant struggle there, just to you know, call it resistance, constant struggle to make sure that you secure for yourself a place in the world. Mm -hmm. And not recognizing that as important in social dynamics basically will be condemning uh, what they do as basically, you know, it's either because they are stupid or because they're victims of false consciousness. And, 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 and I think that it's the two assessments are like, too, too drastic for what exists there, uh, all of that kind of broad set of practices in, in between. Now, I, I'm gonna show you the video and let's see if it works. Um, so again, the video, says something about how we have come to understand dignity in the 21st uh, century. And, and we, the, the global mass of viewers of uh, global media and what we have now got used to celebrate as, uh, as a dignified form of life. Let's see. So, oh, sorry, sorry. Just, just need to. It's gonna be tricky, so I'm just gonna do this. Can you see the image? Yep. Perfect. So let's see.
todos los días me sacrifico en este semáforo para alcanzar lo que más quiero, una victoria, que es mi victoria, tener mi casa, tener mis hijos bien, estar felices, esa va a ser mi victoria el día que, que lo logre, por el momento, sacrificio. A pesar de las dificultades y los problemas, busca cómo salir adelante y cómo sacar su familia adelante. Cómo poder, en este país tan corrupto, salir adelante. This is... Yeah, when I, when I, when I saw it, I was amazed by, of course, the creativity, but also the contrast. That how the creativity, well, the background where from where the creativity emerged, mm. is like the imperative of making a living, the imperative of uh, lacking, uh, say, a permanent job, but then at the same time it's like like really so creative and so artistic, and it's well for you well associated with dignity for me is associated with resistance, but. Well, the both are uh, interrelated for sure. Um, and it's also, yeah, sorry, sorry. Uh, go ahead, go ahead. No, 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 sorry, I interrupted you. Uh, I guess I lost the train of thought. Uh, but yeah, uh, yeah, all I, uh, yeah, I think also just because the contrast between the background uh, from which the creativity emerged and then the creativity itself, again, that's like my reaction would be still you know, the fragility of that kind of dignity yeah. or resistance. And it's very hard also to really make, have a normative stance because, oh, then the, like, you know, the cultural sort of icon is very, you know, from the US, but then this is also how the person actually, uh, you know, find a way of living or, mm. and also find a way to be happy. And I, I find it's very difficult to really make, um, to, to take a normative stance. Uh, Yeah, I, I think that, yeah, thank you for saying that. So it is, it is, it's hard to take a normative stance. Uh, uh, that's why, I mean, one, what my, one of my reactions to that is to the difficulty of having a normative stance is to first go uh, down the road of description. Okay, so just let, let me describe what's going on. Um, we did, with that idea in mind, description, the other thing that is very clear in the video And by the way, this video is part of a, 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 a lineup of a series of videos put together by Al Jazeera um, around 2017-18, in which uh, kind of Global South figures like the Colombian transformer, uh, for example, in, in Ethiopia, in Mali, in Nigeria, in Kenya, in Thailand, in, uh, they, they were celebrated by the The, 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 the creativity and the, the way the ingenuity was helping them to, to, to move forward and then join kind of an alternative world in, in that, that, that universe that Al Jazeera very bravely uh, tried to, 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 to represent and to speak about in the, uh, at the global level. Uh, but what is interesting is that in terms of representation, it's also interesting that, that, that that's what we celebrate today as, as the, as the, as the the ingenuity and the creativity and the desire for a better future in the global south is, is reduced to, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, it, it, it doesn't mean that this is the only representation, but it's a very uh, quite um, popular representation today of the global south, yeah? And it's not very different from the representation of the various man, single man, women uh, in Brazil that, uh, you know, now because, uh, some a small help from the government through Bolsa de Familia and a very clever use of mobile phone. She now has a micro enterprise and then she uses a micro loans in order to break the back of the global order. So it is, it's, 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 an, it's an interesting um, uh, as uh, re-articulations of what are the horizons of possibility for people in the global south. And that's obviously it's interesting because 
a few decades ago, the struggle of the Global South all the way to the 1970s and 19, uh, 1980s was, well, we need a new international economic order. We, we need to change the rules of the game. Uh, the, the, the game is unfair and was established by European powers and the Western allies. We need to change it. Um, uh, but now th that has been replaced. And, I, if, and if we don't replace it, we are going to take up take up and then we're going to struggle and we're going to hijack planes and then we're going to do a whole range of things till we are hurt. I mean, obviously, for that violence and many other problems associated with it, that was not success. But the horizons of possibility were one and have been slowly replaced by others. And uh, so you can have a normative view about those two horizons of possibility, but in again, in descriptive terms, is really important, I feel, and this is why I, I, I get passionate about my work, is to first understand what has happened and what today occupies as the, what has become the, 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 the tapestry that today forms um, struggles to attain a better future. Um, so, so, I mean, I, I have used this video in many other occasions and I say, you know, the Colombian transformer embodies, embodies the world. Now, there's other things that are really interesting about the Colombian transformer, no? Uh, so, for example, how the Colombian transformer manages to secure $20, $20 per day. And if you remember the benchmark used by the yeah. World Bank to assess how much you need in order to live a dignified life in the 21st century is $10. Yeah. He has like a family of or he's himself, his partner, and one or two kids. So he's, he's, he's already on the go of securing that $10 per day. Um, uh, but he secures that through the informal economy. Uh, uh, he, he secures that also by embracing wholeheartedly uh, 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 um, um, images that uh, do not belong to him. So he breaks copyrights. Uh, he also... Um, uh, I don't, you know, he breaks copyrights in order to entertain people on the street on imaginaries that are totally incompatible with uh, a traffic light in Colombia. Um, yeah, so it's a whole range of things there that the Colombia Transformer embodies, a whole range of intersectional realities that the Colombia Transformer embodies that are really, uh, I feel really important for us to understand in order to and this is the project of broken wills to understand what are the contours of, of global life today when we understand the dynamics of poverty in the 21st century. Yeah, and just by hearing from you, I find, you know, to really sort of give a full uh, account of any form of either self-expression or resistance, it really requires, you know, a, the a kind of attentiveness from the observer. And so just by hearing from you, I thought, oh, this is sort of really the, the, the real St. Louis <laughs> in play. And so maybe this, let me relate this to a uh, broader question about doing international legal scholarship and I'm mindful with the time. So maybe just uh, can you uh, so relate what we've discussed uh, to talk a little bit about your relationship with, for example, Twill and from another talk that I just picked up what you said, uh, you said so, you know, for, for people who want to engage with 12 or post-colonial or critical race theory, the kind of worst or say the not, uh, uh, a kind of bad way of engagement would be just claim, okay, I want to apply 12 or post-colonial theory or critical race theory to a problem that I want to address. Now, what would be, uh, you know, a less problematic way of, you know, position oneself within a kind of group of, say, scholar community, but at the same time, uh, not instrumentalize mm -hmm. um, those kind of either you call it theory or methodology or sensibility. Thank you. Yeah. So, so, um, so the the when you say referring to a talk uh, that last week actually I I was invited to give at the ASA Institute with my uh, very close friend Aisha Kubuku and was on critical race theory and post-colonial studies. And one of the things that we decided to do with Aisha was to be very clear at the beginning of that talk um, that in our work and, um, and the way we understand uh, post-colonial theory and critical race theory, 
post-colonial studies and critical race theory is not as a, as a set of methods um, or as a body of methods that then you can use and then apply to a problem. And, 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 and I will extend that to third world approaches to international law. Um, the idea that whether you should take third world approaches to international law and apply to a problem. And, and part of, I, I think you can do it. And, you know, everyone, I mean, I'm happy to, I'm pretty um, promiscuous in my, and my love for different types of scholarship. So I'm happy to people do that. I don't do it. And I, and I think it's limiting because it, it, it basically detaches insights methodological insights from the source uh, that gave birth to them in the first place. So I think it we much, it, it is, I think it is much more useful and productive for the enterprise of post-colonial studies, critical race theory, third world approaches to international law and so on and so forth to, to start from that ground, to start from the messy ground of, convoluted ground of, of, of the third world slash uh, developing world slash uh, global south or questions of race, racialization, race slash racialization slash ethnicity slash uh, so on and so forth. And the same in, 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 in post-colonial studies, it will be uh, in colonialism, post-colonialism slash post-colonialism slash empire slash uh, what have you. And it start from there, uh, and then make sense of what you observe and what you engage with, with all of the conversation. That's why Aisha uh, explained uh, a week ago that for us, post-colonial studies and and critical race theory, like third world approaches to international law, is the water that we swim in. It's not a method out there that we every now and then take out of our, you know, a toolbox. It is just basically how we have come to understand ourselves and the world that exists around us. Um, I think this is important for international law uh, for several reasons. One, and I think that will be useful here, uh, and, 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 and I think it will make sense for many of you, is that international law like law, but international law in particular, it is continues to be understood as a field that it is detached from domestic realities. It's a field that is detached from domestic realities and for anything that is ordinary. So international law is the field that kicks in once uh, human rights is violated to so to set to 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 such an extent that the international obligations come in. Uh, if there is law violence on the ground, well, oh, that you know that can be dealt by the domestic law only when it escalates and, uh, and 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 put into question the sovereign the sovereignty of the national state. International law comes in. International law there is nowhere till the uh, Security Council decides that it is time to act. Uh, so and, and I think that the absence that characterizes international law or the hyper-presence of international law when it is invoked and it finally comes to operate, um, should be when you, are, when you try to think in a much more so sophisticated or much more kind of in a, going to throw much more nuanced lens, we need to make international law the waters that we swim in. This is, this, this is international law, everything that's around us. Um, and, and of course, that, I mean, the, the beauty of that exercise is that you are forced to make connections, but most importantly, you are forced to develop new jurisprudential ways to understand present and future international law. So how will be, and this is a question that is not my question, it's a question that Hillary Charlesworth uh, put uh, forward many years ago, is what will be an international law that departs from everyday realities. Now, how will an international law that actually takes into account what happens um, around us in terms of the maldistribution of resources, the uh, ways in which people are um, uh, discriminated against based on a whole range of uh, present and past um, forms of exclusion from class, race, gender, uh, geographical positioning, uh, and, and uh, etc. 
what I'm saying here is that there's, there's when you think about international law, third world approaches to international law, critical race, post-colonial studies, and you continue, a, a way to pay respect to those traditions is by not instrumentalizing them, but by embracing them so strongly than become part of the way in which you understand just around this true and true. Yeah. I believe this is amazing um, way of uh, formulating uh, how, re how we uh, relate to the stuff we do. And I think it's really great to, to, to hear you, especially in the context of our uh, workshop and uh, uh, people uh, sign up for the event and also our co-organizers, we are always sort of struggling with more or less in, uh, issues. So with that, I guess I'll open up the floor for the audience for uh, Q&A. Um, so if there's any uh, questions or reactions, remarks, comments, feel free to, to just, uh, well, unmute yourself. Well, maybe, while, while people are still gathering, ga ga gathering their uh, thoughts, maybe I'll just uh, throw uh, one final question before people start <laughs> posing their questions. Um, and for you, as now, um, uh, you've been teaching, uh, well, say, uh, you, you have been doing this kind of scholarship for quite some time, but for, say, uh, more like early, early stage, um, uh, scholars, uh, what kind of advice for, or, or, or say lessons you would tell to them uh, who want to actually melange all sort of like methodologies and or genres? Do you ha have you ever encountered say pushback from either journal reviewers or publishers? I guess that's a kind of quite pra practical <laughs> issues that we might, uh, yeah, it might be good to hear from you. Thank you. That's like, yeah. So if I have uh, I got some pushback because of the hectic way in which I tend to approach things. <laughs> yeah, or eclectic way, hectic, eclectic way. Uh, yes, I mean, um, in several times, and 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 not just in terms of, you know, my my written work, and and but also when I have given presentations, you wrap in the wrong way uh, some people with some disciplinary attachments. And I have also um, found, you know, face backlash in uh, job interviews and selection panels. Uh, on the basis of that, I think uh, my, uh, I also, I always, I constantly ask for advice about what to do about these things. Uh, uh, my, my, my advice, if I could give one, is that it is really important when one is engaged in interdisciplinary work to not be ready to respond, but be clear with yourself about why you're doing it and how you're doing it and what is the value of what you, what you do. Um, I think um, that having that clarity in, in one's head is really useful to have the strength to respond when you are put on the spot. Uh, having that ability of saying, this is a very uncomfortable situation. That person is a little bit aggressive. <laughs> I don't know what to do with it. But in my head, at least this is, is clear. It's clear what, I, what I'm doing, what I'm doing, uh, you know, and, 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 and this is how I'm doing it. Um, after that point, after you have expressed honestly your method and 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 in you know in um as far of your ability as you know you as far as possible you have explained the value of what you do is the person um, uh, seduced by it or not that's the problem I think mm -hmm. there's a, a the conviction is there you shouldn't abandon we not we we shouldn't abandon it. Sure. <laughs> Okay, I see uh, two hands up. So first, Michaela. Well, feel free to turn on your video. Oh, great. Hi. Um, it says it can't turn on the video. Oh, there. Oh. Hi. Thank you. Uh, so hi, Michaela. Much. Oh, this was so wonderful. Thank you so much. This is a really fabulous session. And thank you for your work and um, 
I can't wait, wait to read this book. Um, one, a couple of questions. You mentioned in the beginning about radio and um, a lot of the, the 10 years of sort of radio. And I wonder if you could just pick that back up in terms of, um, is this sort of radio that they are, the young people are producing or they're consuming? Mm -hmm. Maybe I misheard that piece about the radio, but sort of the, the thread around art and sort of the, the cultural pieces that they're either um, forms of resistance that they're either consuming or producing. And then the other question that's related to that is this theme around violence um, and sort of thinking about capitalism as a form of violence that they're resisting and also, you know, struggling with as you presented in terms of poverty as a form of violence. Um, and I'm wondering, and also bringing in colonialism to that and just sort of where they're thinking or talking about those forms of violence. Is that is that in overtly around capitalism? Is that overtly around colonialism? Um, so thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Should you. I respond to that or we listen? Well, I guess I, uh, we still have quite some time. So yeah, uh, please go ahead. Perfect. So so sorry, Michaela. So the, it was, um, it was actually was my mispronunciation. So it is, it, it was not radio. So what I say that 10 years is that I have been, uh, the field work that underpins this new book, uh, I've been doing it for 10 years. Uh, and and there's some bits of what I've been doing uh, in Colombia in particular that relates very closely with um, the book. Um, others um, just are kind of loosely connected. Uh, one of the most closely connected field work projects uh, to the Broken Walls book is the one on um, um, the came out published a security and development question mark um, with um, pity criminals or young people at risk of being involved in pity criminality. Um, and, and in terms of what the type of materials that I, I'm using in the book, um, uh, like uh, usual, I use, I interview often and I rarely ended up actually quoting interviews. What I ended up uh, using it's uh, lots of newspaper clippings, uh, my own photographs, um, some drawings uh, that I've been doing um, during interviews. Uh, these are kind of the materials that, that will underpin that project. Um, now, the, the book is also has a, uh, a, a kind of the backbone of the book is also just historical uh, work on the transformation of the developmental state. And it's something that I have been also um, writing over recent years. And uh, because I want to, because I talk about new poverty. So the book talks about, it opens, the first part of the book opens by comparing all forms of poverty with new forms of poverty. And all forms of poverty are characterized by uh, the full absence of, of goods and services and, 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 and yeah, access to material goods. Uh, when the new forms of poverty, because of the, the explosion of GDP and the explosion of production over the last 70 years, uh, the way people are experiencing, the large majority of people are experiencing, experiencing poverty today is no in terms of absolute destitution, but more that kind of uh, ubiquitous lack of enough resources, just getting by uh, hand to mouth kind of uh, type of experience of poverty. So that's the first part of the book. The second part of the book tells the story of how that uh, old poverty, new poverty maps against the transformational developmental policies from uh, the old developmental estate very much focus on uh, the promise of uh, full employment and everything associated to it to the new developmental estate focus on very much individualized interventions. Um, helping uh, people to furnish them, uh, furnish the, sur the immediate surroundings and the inner surroundings in order to be able to, 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 to you know, to, to succeed, to break the back of global forces. Um, and, 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 and obviously the two modalities of development are very problematic and both of them generated their own forms of poverty. And so that's what that, that, that I want to do there. And then the final part of the book is one, the, the ones that turns uh, seriously into questions of violence and that relates to, to the point that you were asking. And there I try to make sense of how these all forms of poverty that 
animated and came out of the all developmental states uh, were related with all forms of violence um, and how the new poverty that relates with the new developmental states relates to new forms of violence. Um, in the case of Colombia, this is very, very clear. Um, so the way in which the resilient levels of, um, thanks to the universe now, uh, low level of violence uh, and, and the difficulties of the government to reverse that trend, uh, for me, says so much about um, the long evolution of, of the, the, the low impact of colonial legacies and how they have mutated as we enter into the 21st century and as now we are getting close you know, kind of close to the to the middle of the of the uh, second decade of the 21st century this has to do with colonialism and of course has to do with capitalism um, I think the the one of the themes that accompanies that book, and as you saw here, is this idea of the promise of work or the lack of work or how we secure living um, uh, in the 21st century. This is no surprise for any one of you, uh, many perhaps in the room trying to secure uh, the first full-time academic job. This full-time employment is increasingly rare, uh, if not totally inexistent. So, I think well, that has been the source of lots of uh, really interesting literature on, on, on the future of work by political economists, anthropologists, sociologists, so on and so forth. I, in my work, I try to, in this book, I'm trying to make sense uh, of that because in conversations about the future of work and how that is being experienced on the ground, you can see the evolution of the, the capitalist system, how it's impacting people on the periphery and how it, um, interacts with uh, the uh, long colonial legacies. Um, yeah. Mm. Thank you for the answers and thank you for the question to uh, Michaela. So Maria, I see your hand up. Hi, thank you so much for, for the session. It's been incredibly interesting to, to um, I have more questions. Uh, one is a bit on the theoretical side. The juxtaposition that you post between kind of the horizon of possibility that was there in the 60s and 70s of trying to change uh, the very structural, the, the more individualized um, level of, of, of trying to sub subvert the 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 situation that you're in like the video um that you showed me uh, and showed all of us so i was wondering what so so if you're also thinking about capitalism and how financialization plays into that what you think the role of law is in kind of demarketing those spaces that are uh, considered legal illegal um the, the notion of what you just spoke about about work informal work and like how the role like the role of law in kind of legitimizing the the, the structures of, of racial capitalism um in its current form that was the the first question and then my second question was just an interest uh in the kind of collaborations that you do and i really love what you said about the kind of eclectic methodological approach. Um, my background is very mixed. Um, I did my PhD in anthropology and did um, political economy before that. So I really love that the idea of trying to, to see things from different perspectives. But what you said in terms of the, um, the collaborations that you do with other scholars, how you work in practice and how you kind of build on each other's strengths um, in that kind of way. So thank you so much. Thanks Thanks for your, um, the, the nice, the two nice questions and especially the second one on collaboration. So, uh, um, and uh, the first one uh, is great. So the, the first question, uh, the way I understood is how the these horizons of possibility have changed and how that change relates to uh, different articulations of the capitalist order uh, back in the say 70s and how capitalism articulates itself through uh, 
you know, appears before our eyes and, uh, and, and, and organizes ourselves in the 21st century and how that has to do with law. Uh, yeah, so thank you. So I, uh, uh, in terms of that question, uh, this is what I'm struggling at the moment. So I, I, I have clear in my mind what the book is doing in terms of the story about poverty, the story about um, the story about the state or developmental policy, the story about balance. Now the question is how wh what's the role of law uh, across that um, that that progression? And my best answer at the moment is that. And this is relates to the, the question, the project that I'm doing recently on informality uh, is an um, article that I'm writing with some colleagues on racial capitalism and, and informality and international economic law. Uh, it is that law has come to occupy a very ambivalent position in relation to, for example, informality or uh, um, violence uh, because, because of the, of the the sheer volume, the sheer size of uh, those realities. And sorry, I'm, I'm using realities too much here, but uh, the sheer volume of informality, the sheer volume of um, uh, violence. So it, just to pick up, info, just to, to pay attention to, inform, for, uh, to informality for a second, um, it is uh, even before the pandemic in 2019, uh, the OECD came out together with the International Labour Organization and confirmed that in the world around 62% of workers work in the formal economy at the, at the global level. And then in this project that we have been doing in Colombia on informality, we uh, independently confirmed that that's the case in Colombia too. So around between 60 and 65%, that was with numbers before the pandemic today, certainly 65% or perhaps more of active uh, uh, people in Colombia work in the informal economy. So the informal economy is the norm, formality is the exception. Uh, so in front of that reality, okay, you can't just not administer, you can't not administer life uh, if you are a state uh, by assuming a hardcore position in relation to the use of law. Um, so law becomes this uh, realm in which life is managed. Problems are not necessarily solved, life is managed. Uh, and in order to secure a social contract that never fully enable, enables or ensures full um, law and order, never fully ensures uh, uh, prosperity, never fully ensures security, never fully ensures uh, labor rights. So law is that Kind of a space in order to intervene uh, uh, and and finish social contract if you think about it in more in eurocentric terms um, many post-colonial theorists have worry about these two so uh pata chatterjee has written about it uh sanjal has written about it and what they have said uh, and this, they have been saying that for a while, is that we can see, what we can see in the in the post-colonial world in the global south is is governmental activities together with legal interventions that try to create uh, 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 to deal with uh, with third spaces. Okay, um, uh, Sanjay talks about the the survival economy. So there's a whole uh, ways of accommodating. Uh, governmental action in which kind of enables informality to subsist because you cannot cancel it. If you cancel it, basically you create a massive social explosion. Uh, the similar thing happens with violence. You know, there's a, there's, a, there's a level of not necessarily acceptance, but it's a level of um, uh, uh, cognizant that, that the certain level there will exist. Um, and uh, that, that, Paying attention to that nuance of that relationship is, is the one that is driving me crazy because I haven't been able to fully pinpoint what's going on there, but that's what as close as I have I've got. Okay. Um, this is interesting, by the way. This is not as bad as, as it sounds, uh, because if there is a future in which we don't we 
a future in which we don't continue to basically chew our own foods, in the, a, a future in which we actually accept that this is what we are and actually informal economy or the informal economy is a really vibrant uh, a space for ensuring survival in particular to giving avenues to women to mediate care work with, uh, with salary work, um, uh, income with love and all the rest. We need to find ways of using legal mechanisms to uh, non canceling, but rather enabling and ensuring better forms of living together. Okay, and 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 I think many more some of the most creative poli public policy interventions in relation to informality, just to use that again as an example, are precisely those are precisely ones that say, you know, we're not going to solve it. It is just too huge. It's too enormous. What we need to ensure on the streets is the provision of cheap food. We need to ensure uh, security. We need to ensure that women are able to work. We need to ensure that in many occasions, uh, senior people will be able to remain active. We need to ensure, um, uh, and a whole provision, we need to ensure that people are able to save, uh, to save resources. So while we do that, well, we need to create a whole regulatory apparatus that enables uh, food vendors to actually um, be safe at the workplace. Uh, we need to ensure that they, they, they are there, out there in the streets, ensure, ensuring security for the communities. Uh, we need to ensure a health system that is able to provide health, not condition on the basis whether you have a formal contract or not. So that, yeah, so anyway, so that's just to tell you where, I'm, where, I'm, where I am at the moment uh, with that. Um, in terms of collaborations, I think uh, the, the formula, the winning formula is always remained uh, able to be amazed by the insights that people from other disciplines have about the stuff that you also care about and how much you learn if you shut up for a bit and then just like, wow, that I never thought that an accountant that is an expert on statistics about informality, there's some people that I've been working uh, uh, with in a moment, or, or labor economists, how much they know about this stuff. I didn't have idea. Um, and I find that the best way to have, to be engaged in collaborations in which you learn, everyone learns, and you keep that um, passion in place, you know, that, that, that driven by a sense of intellectual curiosity. Um, and, and, and this is important, obviously, because anyone here engaging in collaborations, you know, then the, the often tensions uh, bubble up and then you need to be ready to mediate them. So it's important to remember that you are there because you are learning too. Uh, and it's important to, to keep things cordial and, and moving. <laughs> Uh, that's a wonderful uh, answer, uh, given also the context that we're organizing a multidisciplinary <laughs> workshop. So the audience, I believe, are not just from international law, but actually uh, say history, political economy, etc. And we're all interested in, say, broad issues related to global south. And uh, the, the, the idea of organizing this workshop is also that we hope that there could be something that uh, has a, a, a bit of a more permanent existence at the Max Weber program of the EUI. So well, let's <laughs> hope that uh, turned out to be, uh, uh, say, a reality. So uh, I guess we are approaching to uh, the end of our discussion. So <laughs> thank you very much, Luis, for sharing your thought and experience with us. And so best wishes to you and to your book. Um, and I believe everyone here, so me and so I guess I can say we look, we are looking forward to seeing your book in print and also uh, other work um, in, uh, or published. So uh, I'd, I'd like also to thank Pian uh, Jashwani for uh, who helped us set up and advertise the event. And I also like to uh, thank all our audience for uh, attending and participating, contributing to uh, our discussion. And then our next interview would be uh, in a month, so on April 15th, by our Max Weber Fellow, Roberta Biazilo, with Ali uh, Ahmida, professor at the University of New England in May, on uh, genocide, uh, genocide in Libya. So we'd like to invite all of you to join us. 
and um, please stay the tuned uh, to our announcements and the registration details. So thank you very much uh, to everyone and have a lovely rest of the day. Thanks, Wenxu, for a, a lovely uh, conversation and thanks everyone for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, take care. <laughs> okay, bye-bye.